Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Cybersecurity for Automation webinar presented by Indusoft. Um, my name is Scott Cortier, and uh, I'll be hosting the webinar today and then handing it over to Mr. Stephen Miller. And uh, he's going to do a lot of good information here on cybersecurity. And uh, as you can see here in the list, explore uh, system security, and there's a, a CSET tool. Uh, that he's going to talk about, and then we'll have some questions and answers. Before we get, to, before I hand it over to him, I am going to cover a little bit of the security uh, settings and modes and features uh, within IndieSoft uh, Web Studio. It's uh, by no means an all-inclusive list. I'm just going to cover a, a handful of quick topics uh, and, and features regarding uh, some of the different security modes and advanced settings, thin client uh, security, and some remote management security. Um, before um, we get into that, I want to talk that there are multiple uh, video recordings on our website regarding uh, uh, security. We have uh, security considerations, uh, SCADA system security, and system security using uh, IndieSoft Web Studio tools, some of which I'm going to cover in uh, today's webinar. We also have a training video covering our security system. Uh, so I encourage you to get onto our website, check out those uh, uh, videos and webinars and uh, they're going to go much more comprehensive uh, into the security system of IndieSoft Web Studio than I am today. Um, Stephen has quite a bit of information to cover, so I'm going to keep my portion hopefully short and uh, hand things over to him quickly. Uh, for those of you who have not attended one of our webinars before, a couple things on logistics. Uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, we can get information from you via the chat panel and the Q&A panel built into the WebEx. So if you'd like to send us questions, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, we can't look at those all the time during the presentation. Uh, if we happen to notice a question and it's relevant, we'll try to answer it during the, uh, during the webinar, but um, more than likely we'll, we'll wait to the, to the end to answer uh, any of your questions uh, that you might have. So uh, also at the end we'll be um, uh, showing some information on how you can contact uh, IndieSoft, how you can um, download this to, or find the CSET tool that uh, Stephen will be talking about, as well as um, uh, if you uh, reply to our survey, our follow-up survey, that uh, if you provide your name and address and shirt size, we'll send you a T-shirt. Uh, so again, some logistics. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, fill out the survey. Let us know how we're doing and uh, give us some feedback. We'd love to, love to hear from you. Um, Talking real quickly, uh, I just realized uh, this is a ton of information uh, on, on the four different security modes that we have. And I'm not going to read this, but the local only security mode that uh, IndieSoft Web Studio has built in, it's, the, it's our own built-in security mode. And uh, you're going to find for most HMI projects, uh, it's the, the type of uh, security that most people will choose. And um, uh, the distributed server and distributed client is basically the local uh, type uh, security, only you have a server uh, that will host the security system and then the clients that will attach to that uh, uh, server and then get the, their uh, authentication against that server. If for some reason the server is offline, they, the clients will have uh, their own cached copy. So these distributed server and distributed client go hand in hand if you have multiple IndieSoft uh, Web Studio workstation set up, you would probably have one server and then multiple clients uh, authenticating against that. So they, again, go hand in hand. Uh, the domain LDAP uh, is typically used uh, to authenticate against a Microsoft Active Directory, a domain uh, security system that you might have uh, in a plant environment. And typically you're going to get uh, the IT group involved. And uh, it, it's not necessarily just Microsoft Active Directory. That's just where it's commonly used. Because it's um, uh, an, an open protocol or the LDAP protocol is a, a, a recognized standard, other operating systems support it too as well as Linux and, and others. So we have uh, support for that in there as well. And when you're setting up the security system, uh, you're going to see those different modes uh, here and you just get to check the one that you want, set up groups and users. When you set up groups, uh, you basically get uh, this uh, dialog where you can choose uh, the development environment or the engineering environment, what uh, what the group's uh, assignments are, whether or not they can save settings and and modify things in the development environment, and then what uh, they can do in the runtime environment. Uh, so very typically, you're going to see something like 
uh, operators, supervisors, uh, engineers or developers, and maybe maintenance people and what, uh, what they're allowed to do and what they're allowed to get at. Taking a look at some of the advanced settings under this, uh, we have different password options. And related to security, we can set up the number of uh, characters that you have to have, the number of special characters, the minimum number of characters, minimum of, uh, number of alpha and numeric characters that you have to have, whether or not you force the uh, user to uh, change their password after so many days, things of that nature, and whether or not it's case sensitive. And if you click on the uh, uh, additional tab at the top, you can force an auto log off after so many minutes. So, so uh, uh, if somebody logs on and walks away from the system, it automatically kicks them off. So uh, there's also a number of retries that uh, we can auto lock up the account and reset it after so many minutes. So, so those are some nice features built into the uh, uh, Indusoft security system uh, as, as we have it. Um, some security uses. Uh, here up in the upper left is a screenshot of the uh, screen attributes for any given screen. You're going to see in here that you can set up that uh, security level. Let me go back. Uh, I didn't touch on the security levels here. In the um, group setup, you get to choose what the security levels are independently for development and runtime. So for example, if you have an operator maybe has a range from 0 to 50, and then uh, a supervisor has from 0 to 100, let's say, you might give the operator uh, additional privileges based on the security level. Uh, so let me go back to this here, where screen attributes, um, well, you set up that security level in here, uh, not set it up, but you use the security level in here, and uh, this allows whatever that range is uh, to, to have access to this particular screen that this is set up on. You can do that by a screen-by-screen -screen basis. Um, so that's preventing screen access. Another example of, of security uses is to prevent object access. Uh, here I have a button that I placed on the screen. This is another screenshot. Uh, these two are not related. They, they just I wanted to combine them on a single screen. So down here in the lower right, I have a button that I've gone into the uh, command animation, and I've clicked on a button uh, within that command animation that says configuration. And then down here in the bottom uh, is where you would set up the security level for that particular button or, or object as it may be. So um, uh, another thing, and, and this is covered in uh, the training videos that we have online. If you didn't know, we have uh, our full five-day training class online as videos. There is a uh, uh, built-in tag, uh, system-level tag called group high level. It gives you the high level, the security uh, of the user that is signed in and into that group. Um, and it gives you the, the actual result of that. So uh, what you could do is you could disable this button, for example, uh, by saying group high level uh, is less than or equal to, let's say, 100, for example. Or you could use that in a visibility animation, as I've listed here under this bullet point, and actually hide the button if that particular user is not uh, allowed to get into that, uh, uh, that area. And uh, you can do additional things such as e-signatures to challenge them, uh, the users if they need to get into uh, other areas uh, a little bit more secure. The next thing I wanted to point out is uh, some information about thin client security. Uh, we do have some IP security when you're, when you're talking about the web thin client. So you can list a range of IP addresses that are allowed to attach to that project. Uh, and you can add and remove and set up those ranges uh, as I've done in here. Another thing that you'll find uh, in some of our other webinars that it's uh, a very good thing to use, uh, for example, a, a, a web server that is uh, got the security built into it. So you know we typically recommend Microsoft IIS and use that in a lot of our projects and, and just uh, use the security system that's built into that and, and make sure that you get your IT group involved if you're not familiar with that and, and making sure that's as secure as uh, possible that it can be. Um, and another thing that I wanted to talk about is our remote agent uh, security. If you're not familiar with our remote agent, it's, it's basically our download uh, and remote troubleshooting tool. And when you launch that, um, essentially on the uh, development environment, uh, I'm sorry, on the runtime environment, you're going to see um, the remote agent tool. That's the connection uh, tool that lets you uh, establish a connection from the development environment and then download or license or upload files. Um, so you're going to see this on the on the runtime. 
And uh, if you were to go into the setup of that, and here under TCP IP, if you click Users, you can set up the security system within there. In fact, this system prompts you. If you don't have security set up um, when you try to download the first time, it, uh, it prompts you and says, hey, you don't have security. Well, why don't you go ahead and set that up? So it's uh, uh, letting you know that uh, you're not secure at the time, the first time you try that. So if you add those users, then you can see here you can uh, add username, password, and uh, set up the different rights that they have, uh, what they have access to through that system. So maybe you want them to be able to run and stop but not install system files based on user uh, access. So uh, one thing that I forgot to mention here at the top, if you, if you look into our uh, help system within IndieSoft Web Studio, um, one of the things that you can do is you can build in a custom key. And that's uh, depending on if you're running on uh, a Windows desktop or server, that's in a file called remoteapi.ini, or if you're running on a Windows CE or an embedded operating system, it's in a file called ceserver.ini. And basically, you add this uh, section into uh, that INI file, and you put your custom key in there, and then it, uh, it will only uh, interface to systems that uh, have that shared key or have that key um, on both sides. So uh, that's another layer that we have in there. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Stephen Miller and let him present on, on cybersecurity. And again, if you have questions, feel free to put those into the chat panel or the Q&A panel, and we'll get to those uh, at the end. So uh, Stephen, I'm going to unmute you here, and then I'm going to hand you over presenter status. And so you should be able to share your desktop and see everything there. Stephen, you there? I'm there. Okay, well, good morning and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to the uh, webinar. Uh, before I get started, just give you a little background. Uh, uh, I, uh, I'm an associate professor at Eastern New Mexico University uh, in Rio Dosa, New Mexico. Although I uh, do all my teaching online and uh, and remote from from Texas, uh, the uh, uh, also we uh, have a consortium called uh, Sun Online that. Uh, provides uh, uh, we, we provide classes in cybersecurity through that consortium uh, to uh, other community colleges in New Mexico. So a little background uh, also I'm a retired uh, Exxon uh, mobile so a lot of experience in uh, in control systems uh, also at NASA I was in the communi communication command and telemetry systems uh, during the Apollo uh, project and uh, and also uh, worked for TRW Controls uh, before going to work for Exxon. And, and uh, after Exxon uh, started uh, in the academic world, so uh, mainly concentrated in, in IT and, uh, and cybersecurity, uh, even back in the 80s with, uh, with Exxon. So what I'd like to cover today is just to talk a little bit about uh, system security from a control perspective. Uh, and then uh, go into uh, the uh, cybersecurity framework, which is uh, uh, being based off of a uh, uh, presidential executive order, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And then, uh, hey, uh, Stephen, sorry for the interruption, but uh, can you share your desktop? Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll cover the. Uh, uh, some system security uh, from a controls perspective, and then uh, talk about the uh, cybersecurity framework, which the uh, uh, National Institute of Standards uh, uh, has a project going on now uh, that's uh, setting this framework uh, based off an executive order from the president. And then we'll wrap up talking about uh, the CSET tool, which is an enabler uh, to uh, look at risk assessments uh, in your uh, organization and uh, and helps put a plan together that would meet the cybersecurity framework uh, that's uh, coming up here. And uh, actually, tomorrow it's supposed to be rele released if they're if anybody's working in Washington. And then we'll end it with uh, questions and answers. So a little bit uh, control systems uh, are vulnerable to uh, cyber attacks inside and outside the control uh, system network. And uh, to understand those uh, vulnerabilities uh, that are associated with those uh, control systems, you need to know the types of communications that uh, uh, that are in that system, uh, operations associated with the control system and processes, 
and an understanding of how attackers are using uh, system vulnerabilities uh, to their advantage. So uh, a lot of this information, uh, uh, it's at a high level for this presentation. Uh, it was a joint effort with uh, the Idaho Labs and Department of Homeland Security, and Eric Cornelius was kind of the author from this material that uh, I'm going to cover initially. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> the vulnerabilities uh, in a associated with a control system, uh, you first must uh, know your uh, possible communication path into that control system. And uh, as I get in, as all this is going to link back to uh, the CSET tool, because the CSET tool will help uh, you understand your network and all the components within that network, including uh, hardware and software components. So this figure one kind of uh, uh, presents the various uh, devices and uh, communication paths and the methods that can be used to co communicate in a process control environment and uh, and all of these are potential uh, entry entryways for a uh, cyber attack. Uh, in a typical large-scale production system utilizing SCADA or a, a distributed control system configuration, uh, there's many computers and uh, uh, there's controllers and network uh, communications equipment. And usually in a typical, and this is very uh, small scale, there's uh, usually firewalls that separate the internet from the uh, uh, business systems and then a uh, firewall between the uh, production control systems and the business systems. And uh, so uh, as a uh, as a uh, attacker uh, who wishes to assume control of a control system, they're faced with basically three cha challenges. First, they need to uh, gain access to the control system LAN. And I'll talk a little bit more about how they, those uh, methods are to, uh, to get into that, uh, into that control LAN. And then uh, they, through discovery, they have to gain an understanding of the process uh, that uh, you're trying to control. And then uh, once they do that, they gain control of the process and then uh, can do uh, whatever they wish if they have that access. Uh, if you're looking at access to the control land, there's different uh, avenues, uh, the common network architecture uh, through the local area network, uh, the dial-up access to RTUs, uh, vendor support access, uh, IT control communications gear, so coming through the business uh, uh, network, and then uh, corporate VPNs, database links, uh, poorly configured uh, firewalls, uh, peer utility links, and, and uh, uh, one that's kind of tied back to the IT control communications gear would be an app the applications around the email, so another way, uh, another method for attacking. Uh, the attacker needs to accomplish uh, uh, a way to bypass the parameter defenses and gain access uh, to those control lands, so most control system networks are no longer directly uh, accessible remotely from the Internet. So. There is that firewall and, and that separation. Uh, common practice in most industries has a firewall uh, that separates the business LAN and, and the control LAN, and, and uh, this is kind of typical. Uh, it's not the only, this not only helps uh, keep the hackers out, it isolates the control network from uh, outages and uh, uh, malware, worms, and other type of afflictions that occur in the business LAN. Uh, also, most of the attackers' off-the-shelf software tools can directly be applied to this problem, though, so uh, there are methods around uh, getting into the uh, control land, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The second uh, most common uh, architect is the DMZ uh, off the business land. Uh, there's a, a number of other ways that uh, are common attackers can gain access, and if you're familiar with the Stuxnet uh, virus, which most people have been, that are in control systems have a pretty good understanding of that, but uh, uh, through phishing, uh, you can introduce the malware, and then uh, in that business uh, uh, environment uh, or the engineering uh, department environment uh, with a USB drive, you could uh, basically, uh, it will infect that USB drive, and then when you take that, uh, that drive to the uh, 
into the control system LAN and tie it into an engineering uh, system or an HMI system, you propagate the uh, the uh, malware uh, through the control system. So uh, that's just one example of how uh, you can get into the, into the control system LAN. And uh, phishing uh, emails have been pretty prevalent for for distributing malware, and also the use of uh, uh, of these uh, <clears throat> of USB thumb drives. Uh, discovery of the process: uh, once you've got into the LAN, you have the attacker uh, needs to gain a foothold on the control system LAN, uh, and they have to discover how the process uh, works so they can surgically attack uh, uh, to keep components for example if they wanted to shut if it, in looking at a pipeline uh, control system they may want to close a, a block valve which could cause some serious damage on a pipeline uh, excluding the uh, the local possible uh, shutdown controls that may be uh, engineered into that system uh, an attacker also wants to be uh, uh, have a surgical needs for specific uh, uh, for the specifics in order to be effective so they'd have to know how to get uh, how to how to control that uh, that block valve for example and so an attacker that just wants to shut down the process they really don't need any uh, uh, any discovery they can uh, just maybe ping uh, PLCs which in many cases a PLC cannot handle pings and so you shut down the process the damage there would not be as precise as someone actually going in and controlling uh, pumps and valves and whatnot. Uh, the most uh, valuable items to be for an attacker is the points in the data acquisition uh, server database. And so each control system vendor uh, calls those database something different, but nearly every control system uh, assigns each uh, sensor, pump, breaker, and et cetera to a unique number, and so on the communications protocol level, the devices are are uh, simply referred to by a number. So the a surgical attacker needs to a list of these point reference numbers in use, and then the information required to uh, assign a meaningful uh, uh, number to that, and and then take control. Under the HMI uh, display screens would be the other option, and the operator. Uh, HMI screens generally provide the easiest method for understanding the process and then assigning uh, assignment of some kind of a means to uh, to the reference points. Uh, like Scott was pointing out, there's some controls in Indusoft that would uh, permit uh, prohibit that, uh, but there's always a way. You can always never say that everything is totally secure. There's always a way around this from the uh, attacker's point of view. Uh, each control system vendor is unique in which it stores the operator HMI screens and the database points, and and uh, the rules uh, added to the uh, to an intrusion detection system uh, can help identify or spot some of these attacks. Now, in some of these legacy uh, control systems, uh, it's not possible really to have an intrusion detection system running in parallel with the uh, with the control system. So uh, that's not always the the answer for uh, or the way you can detect these things. So, uh, if you're looking at the once you've got control of the process, then sending commands directly to the uh, data acquisition equipment uh, is the uh, is the next and the final step. And the easy way to to uh, control the process is send commands directly uh, to the data acquisition equipment. So, uh, to PLCs or protocol converters and uh, uh, as I mentioned, just sending a ping sometimes can uh, actually uh, take the system down, uh, and this has happened in some of the uh, uh, in some of the uh, uh, attacks that uh, uh, from just off-the-shelf software that you can purchase in, in the black market. Uh, also, they generally uh, accept uh, any command uh, format. Uh, or properly commanded format. So an attacker wishing to control system uh, simply establishes a connection with the data acquisition equipment and then issues the appropriate command so to shut that valve off. And uh, again, the uh, consequences could be pretty uh, disastrous from, from that perspective, <clears throat> again, unless uh, you've engineered some uh, local controls, which uh, is probably the norm. Uh, an effective attack is 
also to export the screen of the uh, operator's HMI control back to the uh, attacker. So uh, there's off-the-shelf software you can uh, that can perform uh, this function both in Windows, Unix, and Linux environments. And the attacker is also limited to uh, uh, commands allowed by uh, the currently logged on operator. Like uh, Scott had mentioned, you have that control in Indusoft to uh, control what operators can do. So, depending on what operator access you've, you've, uh, uh, if you were in an Indusoft uh, product, what you could get to would would be uh, governed by that access uh, from their security. Uh, the man in the middle attacks can be performed on a control. Uh, system protocols uh, if the attacker knows the protocol uh, that they're uh, manipulating and uh, that's kind of what happened in the uh, <clears throat> in the uh, Iranian uh, centrifuge they uh, with the uh, Stuxnet and uh, uh, with the man in the middle the attacker can modify packets in transit uh, providing both a, a full spoof of the operator HMI displays or a full control of the control system and then by inserting those commands into the command stream, the attacker can uh, issue those uh, uh, arbitrary or tag-controlled uh, uh, commands. And uh, by modifying uh, replies, the operator can be presented with modified pictures of the process. So what happened, the, the uh, centrifuge uh, speed of the motors didn't change as far as the operators were concerned in the Iranian uh, uh, Attack, so uh, they never knew there was anything going wrong uh, until it was too late. So, uh, and then direct direct controls from wireless or handheld devices are another uh, option for this man in the middle attack. Uh, <clears throat> so now I'm going to kind of change gears here. That was just kind of an overview of the type of uh, of, of attacks and how you can get into a system, control system, and so. Uh, all of these uh, concerns about the the critical infrastructure uh, has uh, uh, generated the uh, president to issue this executive order 13636, which is uh, to improve the critical infrastructure uh, for cybersecurity. And this was done on February 12th. And as I mentioned, uh, tomorrow uh, the first uh, uh, release was supposed to be uh, uh, sent out for comments, and then, uh, but I'm not sure what the status of that is at this point. I've heard that it's going to be delayed. Uh, this uh, directive calls for uh, the development of a cybersecurity framework that provides a prioritized and flexible, repeatable, uh, performance-based, and uh, cost-effective approach for assisting uh, organizations uh, that are responsible for critical infrastructure services uh, so they can manage their risk. And... Uh, the way that the uh, framework is uh, set up is that it's composed of three parts, uh, the framework core, and uh, then the framework implementation tiers, and the framework profile. And as we go through this framework, uh, uh, one of the things, I was at the Dallas, uh, in last month I was in the Dallas uh, workshop uh, for uh, <clears throat> the framework. And uh, some of the discussions came around the uh, use and hope and the, and the fact that the uh, uh, the labs and Department of Homeland Security have been uh, will probably take the CSET tool and incorporate uh, the framework uh, into that CSET tool. But in my opinion, it's most of it's already there. So I'll try to explain how you can use CSET to help you meet the uh, the cybersecurity framework uh, requirements. So the framework core uh, is a compilation of the cybersecurity activities and uh, references that are common across critical infrastructure sectors. And uh, we'll talk about those. I'll give you more detail in just a minute on all these. Then at the, other, the next level is the framework implementation tiers, and these demonstrate the implementation of the framework core functions at categories and indicate how... Uh, you, the risk for cybersecurity is managed within your organization. So these uh, these tiers are zero through uh, three, and, and uh, uh, that, there was a lot of talk about why does it start at zero, why does it start at one. But anyway, uh, it's zero through three, and uh, three being the most secure, <clears throat> zero being you're just starting uh, uh, maybe your first uh, assessment, which probably most organizations have done some risk assessment. 
uh, the, the the last is the framework profile, and that conveys how an organization uh, manages their cybersecurity risk in, in each one of the framework core functions and the categories, uh, and they identify the subcategories that are uh, uh, implemented uh, or planned for implementation. Those sub, and I'll get into more detail, but subcategories would be like your actual uh, PLCs and uh, uh, your training and of personnel and, and that type of uh, uh, activities. So one thing that the, the framework tries to address, and this was pointed out in the workshop, is it looks at people, process, and technology. So uh, the risk assessments are done based on that. Uh, <clears throat> while uh, uh, the risk assessment in the cyber uh, security framework, uh, the risk is, while it's not a risk management process itself, the framework enables in, in, integration of cybersecurity risk management into uh, organizations' uh, overall risk management process. And that's why I think the CSET tool, if you're using that type of a process, and that's what all it does is enable uh, an organization uh, to do the risk assessment, uh, it would help, it'll help you meet the requirements of the framework. Uh, this framework... Uh, fosters uh, the uh, cybersecurity risk management approaches that uh, take into account the interaction of multiple risk. Uh, it looks at the risk management approach uh, that addresses uh, both the uh, uh, traditional IT uh, technology as well as your control system uh, technology. Uh, it also looks at the risk management practices that encompass the entire organization. Yeah, exposing uh, the deficiencies and the dependencies on uh, on uh, the entire enterprise system, you might say, so and the maturity of that system. So uh, it also is interacting with the different entities around partners, vendors, suppliers, and others. So if you're, uh, uh, it's kind of been a, a norm in a lot of the uh, Fortune 500 uh, companies that have critical infrastructure already doing this and looking at it from an enterprise perspective both in the control side and the business side of their of their networks. Uh, on the cybersecurity risk management practices uh, that are uh, internalized by the organization, so it ensures that decision-making is conducted by a risk-informed process of continuous improvement and uh, and also looking at the cost and uh, versus the, uh, the probability type uh, of, of something happening that, that – uh, could cause a business impact uh, or a environmental impact or a safety impact. Uh, and then the cybersecurity standards that can be used to support risk management activities uh, are all part of what this uh, framework will foster. Uh, kind of a looking at uh, uh, a little tool here that was developed uh, as part of the framework, You're looking at the functions, so the main functions of the of the uh, uh, framework is to identify uh, your risk, uh, protect, detect, uh, respond, and recover. And then uh, out of the categories uh, that you have, uh, you, the, those are the subdivisions of a function into uh, groups of cybersecurity activities uh, more closely tied to uh, the uh, program of needs or the problematic needs of the organization. So uh, an example of a, of a category would include like asset management, uh, access control, <clears throat> or uh, detection processes. Uh, the subcategories uh, would f uh, further subdivide the categories into higher level tactical activities to support the technical implementation. And uh, so uh, under access, the impact of detecting cybersecurity events to inform uh, response and recovery activities could be an example of that. Uh, inventory and track your physical devices and your uh, systems within the organization. Uh, and, and then the uh, informative references are those uh, references to the standards uh, and the guidelines that uh, uh, and maybe policies that you have in your organization as well as the NIST and other uh, standards based on your industry. Uh, when you're implementing uh, the framework, how to use the framework, uh, we're trying to establish uh, or improve a cybersecurity program that you may already have in, in place, uh, communicating the uh, cybersecurity requirements with the stakeholders, and those stakeholders are, 
are uh, the employees, uh, the management, uh, and then the suppliers uh, and users of the uh, uh, of the uh, control system, and then identifying the gaps. Uh, all this kind of t- is enabled uh, through uh, the CSET tool, as I'll mention later. Uh, there's also looking at this as a model for risk management, and then the implementation uh, of uh, of mitigating those uh, exposures through uh, through the controls. So uh, senior management. Th- so there's two parallel processes really, and they overlap. Uh, uh, the senior executive level is they focus on the organizational risk and uh, also looking at the uh, actions of uh, which uh, risk uh, decisions and problems uh, are uh, should be implemented based on maybe cost and uh, uh, probability and uh, impact to uh, items like uh, safety, security, uh, and uh, the business uh, impact itself. Then, uh, <clears throat> and so that would be your mi- mission uh, priorities and your risk uh, appetite and budget. And then the process, uh, the business process level, which interacts here to where it's going to where you take the framework uh, profile that uh, comes out of the ana- analysis, which actually th- through CSET you get a framework profile uh, to help identify where the gaps are, and then actually implementing uh, the, the controls that are needed or the processes that are needed to uh, uh, mitigate those uh, those exposures, and then uh, implementation process. Uh, Things are changing, as you know, all the time in uh, in IT and in uh, control systems. So you're, it's a continuous improvement process, and then uh, changes in the current uh, uh, and future risk or the business will also drive uh, the uh, this continuous improvement for for changes. So, how does the CSET tool help? Uh, well, the CSET uh, security evaluation tool uh, was developed by the Department of Homeland Security and the Idaho Labs, uh, and uh, uh, the product uh, assists organizations in protecting their uh, their key na- uh, national cyber assets. And uh, the process kind of works with first you f- form a team, and and uh, that team assesses uh, det- determines what the assessment details are going to involve or the scope of the assessment. Uh, then you select the standards, and those standards are could be government regulated standards uh, or standards uh, that uh, uh, you may have in your organization from policies and procedures. And then uh, determine uh, the assurance levels. So what kind of level would your system? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more detail on these. But so you get questions to response to the uh, what is the security level that you're trying to achieve and that would be low, medium, or high, and then uh, which would kind of tie back to the tiers in a way from the, from the framework. And then uh, analyze the, uh, the network topology, so looking at your entire network, both your business uh, uh, enterprise network as well as your control uh, system networks and remote uh, system networks, and then to prioritize what components uh, uh, are, are most critical. Uh, and then uh, there's an answer questions to determine whether there's gaps in your security uh, f- based on all of this uh, prior uh, uh, analysis. And then finalize uh, uh, a prioritized action uh, through some type of reporting function. So the CSET tool helps uh, enable or facilitate this whole process. And uh, it it basically provides... Uh, uh, organizations with a systematic and repeatable approach for assessing their uh, posture in in uh, cyber systems and uh, and networks and it's uh, it also includes both high level and detailed questions uh, related to the industry control and IT systems uh, so looking at uh, this is when you right now the the current version of CSET uh, is uh, version 5.1 uh I've been using 4. Uh, the 4.1 version for uh, about a year and a half, and so this is the newest version that's been out a few months. And uh, basically, uh, 
Uh, this software is free, uh, and I'll give you the link to download it if you're interested in it. Uh, it uh, allows you to create the new assessment, or if you have previous assessments, if you have an existing assessment from 4.1, you can bring it in and import it into the into the uh, into 5.1. Uh, so basically, when you start out with uh, doing your assessment, uh, there's an information uh, tool, and this is pretty uh, straightforward. You just enter in the type of assessment you're doing uh, and uh, the description of that assessment, who's responsible for that project or that uh, project assessment. There may be multiple uh, uh, people. Uh, there's an executive summary that you would have to, There's a. it's kind of a default summary that comes up, uh, but uh, uh, you would change that uh, description based on uh, the actual uh, assessment you're trying to do. So this is just the first page, and it, and it just helps uh, identify uh, the title information and what you're trying to do for this assessment and maybe the scope of the assessment. Uh, then uh, then you the next thing is to look at at the, uh, the standards and the risk assessment. So the tool is pretty good at stepping you through all of these things. You could, if you've never done a risk assessment, you just want to do something with a basic assessment, you could click the quick start uh, function and it would take you through and and uh, uh, just give you a basic uh, feel for how to do a, a risk assessment. Uh, but most cases, you really need to look at the uh, the assessment mode, and uh, uh, most users should uh, select the questions based, uh, uh, which is a uh, basically will run you through the the assessment mode that you need to be doing. It'll ask questions about uh, environmental issues around your control system, uh, uh, safety issues, uh, those type of things to help you identify uh, uh, the, uh, the assessment mode that you need to make. Then from that point, uh, you need to select standards. And so there are several different standards uh, uh, that, that are either the NIST standards uh, or either, uh, the NERC uh, is an example of a standard. Uh, for pipeline systems, uh, they have the standard there. So you, you would select the standard uh, uh, requirements. So there's general control system standards. So you can actually do this, uh, use the CSET tool for your IT department, which is recommended. Uh, they should be involved in this as part of the subject matter experts. Uh, you can do sector specific uh, uh, standards. You can select those. You can. Uh, uh, information technology specific standards and uh, and then uh, special requirements uh, the committee for national security systems uh, instructions so there's several ones if you don't know what these different uh, standards are or how they're included uh, this the CSET tool will actually step you through uh, each one of those standards and uh, give you an insight on what they are once you've identified the standard that you need uh, that for your organization or standards, it doesn't have to just be one. Then you need to identify what the uh, uh, the uh, security uh, uh, assurance level is. So what uh, level? And there's a question and answer, uh, uh, basically a wizard that will help you understand whether you're going to. If you want to set up some general uh, uh, security assurance levels, you can just use the general security. But if you want to uh, follow something that's based off of the National Institute of Standards for control systems and critical infrastructure, which would tie back to the framework, then you would select this uh, uh, start with the NIST uh, determination. And you have to run uh, the security assurance level uh, assessment first before you can go further in, into uh, uh, the actual uh, uh, assessment, uh, full detail assessment based off the standards. Uh, the next step is looking at uh, at your uh, diagrams for environment, and uh, so basically, you have uh, you need to have uh, a, a diagram, and this CSET uh, accepts only uh, Windows uh, uh, seven or above, and and uh, Windows as also uh, uh, the uh, Visio uh, two thousand seven two thousand ten. Uh, versions of Visio, and so you have to have a Visio diagram. Now you can develop, you don't have to have Visio, you could actually develop the diagram 
uh, in their in the uh, uh, in this diagram uh, function that's part of CSET. If you already have diagrams, which we've worked with companies at, at Eastern New Mexico University, we've had companies come in for our boot camps, and they bring their own diagrams in Visio, and we import those in. So you can actually import a diagram or diagrams. And uh, the, uh, the other thing about this uh, diagram function is that it also will point out uh, automatically flag or highlight potential uh, security uh, areas where there's, for example, maybe you need a firewall, you don't have one, it'll identify that uh, in, the, in the diagram. Uh, those diagrams to typical, uh, well, you would look at both your uh, your corporate uh, uh, LAN and your, uh, and your control system and remote uh, system uh, functions and substations. So you want to include everything uh, that you're trying to assess. Again, it would be determine on that assessment level. And then uh, there's this assessment, uh, as we talked about, that security assurance level can vary, and that's what these colors kind of show. Uh, the corporate level may be uh, something that would be uh, a lower uh, assurance level, but uh, you may have a medium or a high uh, SAL uh, for your control system or or your remote uh, uh, control systems. Uh, if you have distributed control type systems like uh, for backup, uh, in some cases, or centralized control systems like for pipeline control, but in each uh, maybe uh, division, they may have a, a sub uh, control system that could take over if the main system's out. So all of those would be assessed uh, and then uh, given some kind of a, a security uh, assurance level, and then you could do your assessments on that. That also helps prioritize uh, what you're going to work on first as far as closing gaps. The next thing is to look at the actual uh, uh, is doing the questions and that's where you really run through the assessment. Again, these assessments are only as good as the subject matter experts uh, that you have and the, and the uh, quality of the answers that are given. So uh, a typical uh, uh, question might be like for access control, and uh, each one of those uh, questions uh, you can either answer yes, no, not applicable, or uh, you can have a uh, alternative. And then there's a little uh, pad here where you can a text pad where you can put notes, or you may cover this under a special uh, uh, process or procedure. And then the the uh, the little I there is a way that would tell you. Uh, in more detail, how that question uh, pertains to the to the uh, uh, security uh, uh, assurance level and to the standard that you uh, happen to work. And all these questions are generated based off of what standard you picked, what levels uh, uh, you have in security uh, in your assurance levels, and uh, in the diagram that you developed. And so, uh, if you were uh, so, the subject areas. And we can tie this back to the to the framework, uh, those subcategories that we mentioned in the framework. That uh, the uh, <clears throat> so some of the subject matter, subject areas would be it would generate questions on uh, systems integrity, uh, uh, the account management, access control, monitoring, and malware uh, on down. It also covers training, uh, the environmental uh, security, uh, personnel. Uh, there's also as the uh, physical security, uh, what kind of plans you have in place, those type of things. And it also addresses, based off the security uh, assurance level, uh, the uh, impact to uh, safety and environmental uh, issues uh, around the control system. Uh, then, uh, after you've done completed the uh, the assessment, uh, it gives you. A dashboard of uh, where you're at uh, on this particular, uh, or an analysis of of where what your uh, top control concerns may be. So uh, this example is kind of showing uh, uh, where there uh, the level of uh, possible uh, areas where you, you need to look at around account management or access control, and then you could get a detailed report uh, after looking at this summary. Uh, that would identify and highlight uh, what the gaps are in those particular uh, subcategories 
and uh, then you would have to uh, maybe with an executive summary, it would give you some details on uh, uh, for the for the management or how to talk to the management about these gaps and what it might mean from a business perspective or uh, environmental or safety perspective. Uh, then the, you can do a site uh, summary. So if you were looking at just the uh, if you wanted to to take the IT uh, the business uh, uh, n network and turn that over to IT. Here's a list for them to look at and uh, and then maybe you have a site for your remote uh, facilities as well as the con central control system uh, site. So uh, you can basically break that down and identify it to different areas. Uh, and then detail options. Maybe the engineers in the control system environment would take get a certain section to work on around PLCs uh, where uh, uh, you may have the IT people working more on the the issues that might be around uh, firewalls or whatnot. So you can actually uh, generate this report in PDF or a Word document or in .x. And so, uh, and uh, that kind of wraps up the, uh, the the overview of the uh, CSET tool. Now uh, at Eastern we uh, provide uh, uh, a one week boot camp uh, to help. Uh, Companies understand and how to use the uh, the CSET tool, and uh, we actually will help uh, do a, a dry run uh, or an, an initial assessment uh, of of your uh, of your control system or your uh, overall uh, enterprise network. And uh, uh, part of that control system is looking at security, and uh, we actually uh, also as part of this this came from a grant that we worked on last year and so uh the outcomes from this boot camp require that you have a uh, uh that you get certified as an IS 821 critical infrastructure uh, and key uh, resources support uh, uh certification and then an IS 860 which is the uh, uh the NIP which is stands for the national uh uh, uh integration or infrastructure uh, protection plan so understanding that process and who's involved in that process uh, and then uh, uh, we uh, provide the uh, uh, the 4016 risk assessment uh, certification as part of that what that's a national security agency certification that our university is uh, certified to uh, to uh, provide uh, we also have uh, Compia Security Plus and uh, InfoSec 4011, 4016, and DOD 8370 uh, uh, courses that are both uh, credited our courses, and then we also have a, a professional training, uh, non-credited, uh, all online that we provide. The boot camp's not online at this point, but uh, all of our, our basic uh, and our our uh, uh, professional development, uh, cybersecurity, 4011, 4016, and DOD uh, certifications, and CompTIA Security Plus are all online. So uh, that kind of uh, gives you a uh, an introduction to uh, the CSET tool and and the uh, and the NIST uh, uh, critical infrastructure framework and uh, how those two uh, tie together. And um, if you need to contact me, there's my contact information uh, along with the uh, our uh, Cybersecurity Center of Excellence uh, website information. Uh, if you want to download the uh, CSAT tool, there's the link. And uh, this stuff will be available later on uh, through Indisoft on their, uh, in their uh, uh, webinar uh, portion of their website. So, uh, Scott, I'll take questions. Great. Uh, Stephen, thank you. Uh, I'll tell you what, I learned a lot. Uh, I was not necessarily uh, aware of all of these tools. Um, uh, really, really appreciate you joining us today. I'm going to um, take back uh, presenter status from you here, and uh, you should be able to see my desktop now. We, we've got a couple of questions in the queue. Uh, let's see, as we get back here. Okay. Um, one of the questions that we had, actually you, you kind of answered it as uh, on one of your last slides, was uh, related to the courses or the boot camp uh, being available either online uh, 
Uh, and I saw in the fine print that it looks like it's uh, either an on-campus or uh, it could be done on-site as well. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, yes. Uh, we will uh, do a custom uh, boot camp for any organization, and we'll come to their facility if they have uh, uh, computers. Basically, we just need uh, regular windows with uh, Internet access and uh, uh, we have a virtual lab that we can access through the internet, so uh, so we can either do that or or we can you can come to Riadosa, New Mexico. Uh, the the skiing's great and uh, the climate's great in the summertime, so uh, we will facilitate that at our at our facility there if if that's you uh, if you're willing to do that. We do this through our community uh, education professional training, so. You can contact me, and I can get you involved. But we have special rates for uh, 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 for organizations where uh, if they have five or more, uh, the cost is basically the same. So it's around five thousand dollars for the uh, and plus uh, travel expenses if we have to uh, go to your facility. And uh, so that and then as far as our our uh, cybersecurity online uh, classes, those. Uh, uh, you can go through Community Ed to uh, get the information about those. And I have that website. Uh, you can go to that website. Or okay. And again, for for those of you who missed it, uh, as Stephen mentioned, we're going to post the uh, presentations as well as a recorded video uh, here in the next couple of days uh, on our website. So uh, feel free to check back and, and check those out. Another um, question that came in is, uh, is the use of the NIST cybersecurity framework mandatory, or is this assessment going to be required by just by my industry sector or maybe for insurance reasons? It's a real good question, and, and uh, I guess the, the answer is uh, uh, that it, it's, uh, not a, uh, it's not law. Uh, they're hoping uh, to uh, get uh, organizations or uh, uh, the different industry uh, uh, groups to uh, to set these standards and 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 adhere to the standards on their own. Uh, there was a lot of talk about this during the workshops, and uh, there's some you know the, the actually the Department of Homeland Security has been uh, told that they're going to be the ones to help facilitate uh, in getting the uh, uh, helping uh, the industry get these. Uh, controls and the assessments out there. Uh, the NIST just helped uh, coordinate getting the standards set. So uh, I hope I answered it. But we're hoping that we don't we can self-govern ourselves and not have a law uh, be passed that we have to do something. Uh, having worked you, uh, for an oil company, I, you know, we tried to do what we could do without uh, having to have uh, somebody force us to do it. We tried to do the right thing. Uh, you absolutely answered the question. There's, there's one more question. Uh, I'm going to frame it a little bit differently than was asked, but I'm going to also inject uh, some experience that I've learned in my career over over 25 years of doing automation. Um, it's something that I learned about uh, making backups or, or regularly archiving your your uh, your system. It's uh, those uh, th there's two kinds of people: those who uh, do it on a regular basis and those that will do it on a regular basis. So uh, eventually you're going to have problems. The the question, the next question that, that uh, uh, is at hand, again, I'm going to frame it a little bit different than was asked. Um, you know, there's, there's, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of installations of control systems worldwide that have, have never had any kind of security system built into it. What kind of suggestions do you have for those people who don't think that they're under risk uh, and, and might um, not participate in something like this, but uh, you know, w what suggestions do you have for those kind of people? Well, uh, they should be uh, standalone for one thing, not connected to any network. So uh, that would be the safest way uh, to uh, uh, to protect those systems. And uh, there's basically three categories of uh, control systems. Uh, based on uh, some research that was done through the Department of Homeland Security and Idaho Labs, and that would be uh, uh, the legacy systems, which are those systems that, uh, like I used to put in when I was at TRW Controls 30-some uh, years ago or 40-some years ago, whatever. And then uh, 
Uh, so, and there, even those are proprietary uh, systems. Uh, they could uh, still have. Uh, there still could be a, a, a physical uh, penetration of those systems. So, uh, and then there's the hybrid, which is a, a lot of those. In fact, we just did a a, a, a risk assessment in January for a a, a company, and uh, they had. Uh, uh, legacy and uh, and the uh, and the new systems, so we call that a hybrid system. So and then the the newer technology systems, which would be using like the Indosoft type software uh, and Windows based, uh, uh, have a lot more uh, capabilities as far as uh, uh, forensics and and uh, intrusion detection. But they're also uh, because it's newer technology. Uh, is more vulnerable to uh, to uh, network access. So again, I guess the, what I would say is: is it online? Uh, is it connected uh, to business networks or other networks? Then you uh, you have wireless devices. Uh, you need to consider that. So doing an initial risk assessment, not trying to make a big deal, but just trying to understand where you're at, is really important. I think. Uh, then you can determine whether what's the cost versus the risk and the probability of something happening. And the probability may be lower in some systems, especially if they're not connected to any network. So, uh, uh, but there's, like you had mentioned too, there's there's kind of basic IT ri uh, uh, risks that you need to understand, and that'd be like for passwords or the physical uh, risk or backup uh, and recovery. Uh, I can remember uh, at Exxon Pipeline, we had a power outage that wiped out all of our disk systems. This was on many computers. We, in our, in a, and so we had to, if we wouldn't have had a risk assessment and a business continuity plan, we would have been in dire straits. But we had that plan, so we knew what we could do uh, uh, to mitigate the the issue until we could get our, until they ordered new uh, disk systems to bring into the, into the uh, control environment and get us back up and running. So... Yeah. Anyway, that's yeah. my I, I, I was actually trying to uh, to lead you because uh, uh, you know even though you don't think that you're under risk, uh, you you probably are. Well, that's true. Um, yeah, you are. There's yeah. always, like I said, yeah. there's. It could just be your own. Uh, uh, I'm just going back to when we were all standalone uh, systems for controls, and uh, there was still risk involved. There was the physical risk. There was uh, uh, the risk of failure, equipment failure, disasters. So there's always some type of risk, and you need to understand what that potential risk could be. Yeah. I have a, a friend of mine another, that... Go ahead. Go ahead. Cyber is just uh, one of those that can happen. It could be a natural disaster. Uh, you know, it could be a, a, a fire in your control system area. It could be a, a bear. When I worked, uh, when I did some work on the uh, Alaska pipeline, we actually had a bear come into the control system. So, <laughs> what, now that's one yeah. you don't think about too much. <laughs> right, right. Um, we have a. Uh, oh, what I was going to say is, I I, I have a friend that, that runs a fairly large website, and uh, they they put a tool on their website and found that they were getting attacks probably about every four or five minutes. You know, quite quite often during a general day, they were trying to be hacked. Uh, they didn't, never ever realized that until they put that tool on. Right. Yeah. Uh, we have one more question here, um, and let's see. I'm going to read this and try to explain. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with these protocols, but uh, a question regarding CIP, and I believe that's uh, one of the flavors of a of a Ethernet IP protocol. Uh, I have had many conversations with customers stating they cannot use a routable protocol in their control systems because of CIP. One customer even denied an Ethernet enabled control even though we weren't going to, to use it. Uh, do you have any comments, or could you elaborate on interpretation of the regulations? Well, that's not an area I know the regulation that specific. So I could follow up and uh, and ask uh, some of the uh, contacts I work with there at uh, the labs. And if you, if you want to uh, contact me, I can follow up on that. Okay. We, we, uh, we do have the person who... Uh, go ahead, sir. 
it's not something I, I know right off the top of my head, so uh, but I can actually get the answer if you if you uh, would like. Uh, Great, yeah, we have the, uh, uh, the the name of the person who has asked the question, so if uh, if they can uh, make sure that they fill out our survey, so we have their contact information. We may already have it, but. Uh, uh, so we can get their contact information and reply directly to them. That would be great. Yeah. So if you could uh, if you could find that out, that would be very very helpful. Okay. So, no problem. Um, Stephen, I'd like to thank you very much. This was uh, very informative. I personally learned a lot, um, and I don't see any more questions in the queue. Uh, we're just a little bit over the uh, top of the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar. Uh, and, and again, Stephen and and everybody for, uh, who attended, really thank you um, uh, quite a bit. Uh, IndieSoft really appreciates it and uh, uh, look forward to future webinars. Again, uh, for those of you who haven't attended before, um, there's contact information on this slide. We're going to be posting the slides as well as the vid recorded video of this on our website in the next couple of days or so, and uh, so you should be able to find that. Uh, you look forward to a, a survey coming soon uh, as an email to you once you fill that out. To give us your name and address and shirt size, we will uh, happily send you a webinar series t-shirt thanking you for attending and uh, look forward to uh, uh, seeing you guys at uh, additional uh, webinars uh, upcoming in, in the future. So again, Stephen, thank you very much. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, everybody have a great day, great rest of your day, or if you're headed home, uh, have a great evening. Thanks. And uh, we'll see you again later.